The title for the sermon this morning is Justification. The ever familiar teaching of justification by faith alone must never become so mundane that it fails to lift our hearts to praise God and lead us to rejoice in the great gift Christ worked upon the cross. How many of us know the phrase, and I think this is maybe something that is culturally common, everybody might know this, familiarity breeds contempt. We've all heard that, right? So I started asking myself, why? Why does familiarity breed contempt? Is it because the familiar is not good? Is it because we need something new, something shiny? which makes me think of that big lobster in that cartoon we watched, shiny, you know, like Becca's steering wheel. Yeah, sorry. Do we need something like that? Do I need bling on my steering wheel to make me happy? Do I need some new thing? The answer is our flesh wants that, but do we need that? Or is there a beauty to the familiar that we fail to see? Is there a goodness to intimacy? See, what synonym for familiarity is intimacy. It's coming to a knowledge of something where you know it inside and out. Do you know it in such a manner that it is something that you know better than anybody? And yet, how often do our hearts grow cold with the familiar? It makes me think of oatmeal. I don't know about you, but oatmeal is terribly familiar. I've eaten gallons of it. And I'm not going to say pounds. I'm going to say gallons. That same green, is it green? Gray, gray, gray sludge that slopped into the bowl. It's not an appealing looking thing. You know, when you watch apocalyptic movies and they give you the gruel as you go through the prison line or whatever it is, it looks like runny oatmeal, does it not? Very familiar. And can our hearts not grow cold to something that is good? They can. It doesn't have to, though. I think very often the familiar, what it does is it actually exposes our heart. Because how often do we become familiar with a person, and that person that we are the most familiar with, we treat worse than anybody? Or we have the freedom to treat worse than anybody, whoever that person might be. And we might make the statement, well, they have the security or the safety or the comfort of doing it, and I agree to all those things, and they feel free to treat you like that because they know you're going to be there. However, that doesn't justify or make it right that there is this contemptible behavior that comes with the familiar. Familiarity does not have to breed contempt, though it does. And what that does is expose our hearts. If I am treating that which is intimate or familiar in a contemptible way or a terrible way, what's going on in me? What's happening in my own heart? I think many of us could spend a lot of time thinking about it. Why do I treat fill in the blank? It could be almost anything. I don't know where you sit, and I don't know what first comes to your mind, but I know there are things that come to my mind. One of the first things that come to my mind is, why do I treat my wife the way I do? Now, you might, from examples like this, be like, Brian must treat Betsy terrible. Man, I treat her like a queen. I think she's better than anybody in the room, right? If it was to a contest to like walk through the line and say who I like the most, everybody's going to lose, Right? I, I love her so much that my like for you seems like contempt, right? So don't take the example that I'm about to give as somehow I treat her poorly. Because I don't. I try to treat her with great deference and respect and honor, and yet there are times that I become irritable with her. There are times in which I do express this contempt because the intimacy that we share, and I ask myself, why? Why do I treat her like that? How dumb. How foolish. How unhelpful. Does my treatment of her like that show love? Does it show kindness? Does it show goodness? Does it show any sort of desire to see movement in our relationship towards growing in 
greater and greater levels of familiarity, deeper levels of intimacy with one another? No, it, it shows my selfishness. It shows my short-sightedness. It shows my foolishness. It shows my fleshly tendency to want what I want, no matter what I want. And the list could go on. I could spend a lot of time tearing my own heart down in this. But ask yourself that same question when you become familiar or deeply intimate with something or someone, why do you get to this place? We shouldn't. I think in some regard it is a faithless, selfish act. I think it is a loveless act. And the love of Christ, if it compels us or controls us, as the Scripture says it should, then should we not repent of contemptible feelings, emotions, and actions when we become familiar? Now, we all enter that into particular relationships. When we think about relationships, we, we, that's where we all go. Or maybe many of us. I, I don't know if all of us. I don't know everybody heart and mind in this room. But I'm going to step away from the relationships and go into maybe our greatest relationship between us and God and an understanding of an idea. I am going to preach to you the idea, the theological concept that we are ever so familiar with, justification. If you didn't get it by the title, you got it now. I'm preaching about justification. Justification. And I asked Kevin just before I came up here, Kevin, how many times have I from this pulpit preached about justification? He said 472, I think. <laughs> Give or take. Give or take. Some of you might be able to get up here and be like, Johnson, I know what you're going to say. I've listened to so many of your sermons, big boy, that I know what's going to come out of your mouth. Familiar level of intimacy that we have with one another by showing up to the same room, listening to things out of the scripture week in and week out. And within philosophy and the history of philosophy and even in the history of theology, there is this idea that we need to hear something new, at least spun in a new way. And I want to push against that. I'm not going to bring you a sermon that I dug out of the annals. I don't actually have sermons like that, by the way. Um, I'm not going to preach to you something I've preached before as in a, you know, a, a, a pre-prepared kind of thing that I don't even have to think about that I can just stand up and do. No, I, I put prayerful time into this. I've spent time reading the Word. I've spent time asking God, what do the people need? And over and again, I was overwhelming, drawn to the place where I want to encourage us not to become contemptible towards that which is familiar. You maybe have heard the phrase, you know, we are justified by faith alone. And about two or three weeks ago, I gave this phrase, faith alone justifies, but it is not, or, or the faith that justifies is not alone. It's a rough John Calvin quote. Ironically, I heard that this week, and it was attributed to a huddle leader. I heard this huddle leader say this. Man, I'm like, it was said 500 years before a 19-year-old huddle leader said it to the 14-year-old kid. But it becomes so familiar to us that we don't even understand where it came from and the depth of application that can be brought by it. Do not harden your heart today while we hear about these things. Do not harden your heart to this ever-familiar set of phrases. How many of us know Galatians 3, 14 through, or 10 through 14 and know it well? How many of us know that the law brings curse? How many of us know that we are justified by faith alone? I think many, if not all of us. If this is a new concept for you, hook in. Understand you won't understand some of it. And by God's grace, you'll hear this sermon about 400 more times, and it'll begin to impact your life, and you will seek to apply. I think the great application for me, who is over overly familiar with it maybe, is that my declaration of righteousness and rightness in this world is not had by anything that I can do. And I try to do a lot of good things. Like I try to love my wife and children. I try to love my neighbors as myself. I try to present the gospel to people with great clarity and regularity, not only from this pulpit, but from my house and in other places that I go. 
I could stand there and beat my chest and say, look at the deeds that I have done. But if I am going to hold those before God and say, you need to consider me righteous because of what I've done here, what is going to happen? Curse. I'm going to be cursed. I'm going to be damned. I'm going to be condemned. And so my justification, my rightness before God, comes by faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The person and work of Jesus Christ is all that I have to come and hold before God. On the day of judgment, when I come and hand him something, what am I going to hand him? It better be the righteousness of Christ. And I'm telling you, that brings me great comfort. Because not, not only do I just mess up a lot, I know that within the depths of my soul, even when I'm doing well, I am self-aware enough to know that it is ugly and dark and black, and I need that Savior. And now that I've received Christ, I'm not going to seek to commend myself to Him by actions that I've done. And I tell you what, friends, it relieves me. It's a huge relief. Why? Well, consider this last week. This last week, we went and we had all these young souls and which had been entrusted to a group of leaders from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And you could labor over them, seeking to get them to grasp and understand the truth of the gospel. And you know what they're going to do predominantly? They're going to sneak out at night to hook up with boys. Because they did. And they're going to arrogantly act like they know what is going on when in reality... They don't. And they are going to have interactions and relationships with one another that are not defined and described by faith and in faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter how hard I try, I can't save them all. Or any of them, for that matter. I don't have to be the Savior. That's a relief. And you might be like, Brian, you're a megalomaniac. If you think you're the Savior, you think you're a Savior too, by the way. I am not unique in this. While you may not phrase it in the same way, we all have a measure and manner of God complex amongst us in which we think we are the most competent ones in the room at any given time. Even if we have self-esteem issues, we still think very highly of our own abilities. Otherwise, we would never commend ourselves in the ways that we do. The fact is, is it's not just a relief to Brian relief to any who follow Christ. Any who follow Christ and trust in Him have the relief of not having to be their own Savior. Not only not having to be their own Savior, but I don't have to be anybody else's Savior. So let's go to kids. For those of you who don't have kids, we'll hopefully move to a different example. But with kids, how many of you have great anxiety about your grandkids or your kids and their salvation? And when they do things that kids do that are foolish and stupid, does it twist your heart or do you sleep well? I tell you what, oftentimes my kids do things and I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus, help them, right? And then I lay there and worry at night a little bit. And then I have to remember, wait a second, Jesus is Lord, not me. My worry is not going to add a second to my life. My worry is not going to bring salvation to them. My worry is not going to change the situation. And so when I recognize that I am justified by faith alone, what do I do? I run to Christ. I cast my cares upon Him because He cares for me. I cannot add one minute to my life. I cannot add one hair to my head. I cannot keep and stay the hand of a sovereign God in the world. My daughter woke up very early this morning to get back to her job in Colorado. And as she went driving for a five-hour drive after not sleeping more than a couple hours a night every night for weeks on end, did I worry? <laughs> no, <laughs> not for a nanosecond. Why? Because, well, last night I was studying about this and I went, God's sovereign and he's got her. And then I remember all the trips that I took like that. I have a friend that used to call me the midnight rider. I think you still might, maybe. Because I would take off and just go. 
Two in the morning. See you guys. What? You're leaving? Yes. You got a four-hour drive? Yep. I'll do it. Don't worry. Makes me want to call my mom and say sorry. But as she does that, is my worry going to add anything to it? No. The doctrine of justification by faith alone leads me to a place where I can trust in the Savior and King to take care of my daughter, to take care of my family, to take care of the church. Do you know you people sitting here cause me great anxiety at times? Do you know I sit here and fret and worry about the people that are not sitting here? Where are they at? What are they doing? What's going on in their lives? And I realize I'm not your Savior, and I have to remember that over and over and over again. So how did I sleep last night in preparation to come see you guys again? I slept great. Why? Because justification, your justification comes through faith and not anything that I can do. I can't save you. I can't make you better. I can't say just the right thing to hopefully make your life good. I can't. No matter how much I counsel, no matter how much I yell and scream, no matter how much I jump up and down, straighten on my belt and go like this, ah, would you get it, people? Doesn't matter. I yell because I like yelling. Um, right? I don't, I don't yell because I think somehow it's going to get through to you. I yell because it's probably a function of my personality to some degree. And so you come here this morning not to hopefully get something from me because I'm the good provider. You come together this morning to rejoice in the one Savior and King Jesus, to remember who He is and what He's done, to, to take hold of maybe what you have forgotten, grasp it tightly and run down that road and then look around and go, other people are doing the same thing as I am. Other people are wanting to do what Christ has called us to do in Him. They are seeking to express a measure and a manner of faith according to the grace of God given to them. And so I get to rejoice that as I see your faces here, I know to the best of your humble ability, by God's good grace, you're trusting in Jesus. Amen. And I'm thankful for that. For every person in this room that expresses faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone, I am thankful. I can get all twisted and upset about all kinds of things, but I am thankful for those that love the Lord Jesus and run with Him as much as I can, by God's grace. And the doctrine of justification allows me to have that gratitude in my heart for you. Because you know what? It's going to cut right now, so prepare. Hold on. I don't really have much to be thankful for in any of you. Other than that. Yeah, let that one burn a little bit. I'm going to pour salt in it now. There's nothing that you can say or do to make me think otherwise. Why? Because I know you. You're like, you don't know me, Johnson. Well, yeah, not like you think I'm saying I know you, but I know you because you're human. You're a person. You think about you more than you think about anything or anyone else. I know that for a fact. Why? Because I've talked to you. And if I haven't talked to you, I know that the word describes you. And so that is you. Your condition, apart from Christ, is abysmally lost and in need. And there's nothing that you can do to avail yourself to make God happy, let alone me, who is a judge with evil thoughts. Miserable, isn't it? And yet, the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ holds us fast and tight. And I don't have to look at you through my fleshly lenses or my selfish, arrogant tendencies, I can look at you through the lens of faith and rejoice in you as created in the image of God and redeemed in Christ. I can be gracious and patient and merciful. Why? Because I understand who you are and whose you are. You're a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. And when I begin to look at you through the lenses of Christ, it changes how I feel about you and how I think about you. And I begin to be able to rejoice to gather together with you irrespective of the sin that you have in your life. Judge me all you want. Get in. Dig around in it. Even tell me about it. I'll be like, yeah, that's, that's, most of that's true. And yet, what do we fall back on? Not the law. Not self-righteousness. Not my own deeds. 
Not an argument of who's better, because I guarantee most of you in this room, I will out-argue you just in volume, right? Somebody in this room is like, well, I can be louder than you. Come on, son, let's try it. There are many metrics and measures in which we might come and think that we've exercised some sort of victory, but at the end of the day, Christ is the only victor. Christ is the only king. Christ is the only savior. And any other metrics and measures of salvation fail. And so when I gather together with you, sinful you and sinful me, and we come in the name of Christ, we are coming because we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone, for his glory alone, through the word of God alone. I rejoice that I can do that. I rejoice that we together can sing. How often do you have a hard time finding that something to rejoice in? How often do you find that the negative is so heavy and outweighs life so much that there is nothing that could lift you from the doldrums of how you feel in the moment? And there's nothing that could take you out of this place where you only have contempt for your fellow man. I get there very often. I get there very often. And yet what drags me from that over and over and over and over again is the doctrine of justification by faith alone, in Christ alone. I begin to look through the lenses of Christ rather than my own fleshly lenses that are dim and dull, that are afflicted with selfish and foolish thoughts and behaviors. If you don't believe that justification is can do that, just spend the time reading Galatians. Spend the time reading Ephesians. Spend your time reading Romans, books that are about justification by faith alone in Christ alone. And the web that goes out from that doctrine is wide and broad, and the application of it is deep. Dig in and rejoice, friends. The depth of what we have this morning is the sermon is now going to start. Sorry. I mean, kind of. The depth of what we can learn and apply here, I believe, is the rejoicing in the fact that Christ has redeemed us from the curse. The curse of the law. He died upon the tree as prophesied and foretold. It was promised of him to come and do this. And as he did, what can we do? We can say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. And we can allow it to transform how we think, how we feel, how we act. We can be ever thankful for the goodness of God in Christ Jesus that the righteous shall live by faith and not deeds of the law. Verse 10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. All who rely on works of the law are under a curse. If you are going to try to do the deeds of the law, we're going to get to a couple verses from now, you're going to have to live by them. You're going to have to live by them. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things, not just some things, all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Cursed is every man who doesn't do that, who doesn't do every jot and every tittle. And here's the thing. Our forms of legalism in Western thought and world don't even come close to achieving all the things written in the law. Our forms of legalism in American culture are so lacking when it comes to the full-throated nature of the law that there's nothing we can do to actually get there. And I don't care what tradition you come from. I don't care what church history has taught you. I don't care how big and thick the books are that you read. You can pile up law after law after law after law. There is an insufficiency to the law to bring salvation because everyone who lives by the law is what? Cursed. The law and the word of God and the law of man is going to do nothing but condemn us. And you can try to do every little thing, but it's not going to work. It is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For it is written, the righteous shall live by what? 
faith. This was something that was written prior to the law even being handed to the people of God. If you go to Genesis chapter 15, which we've already gone to before, it talks about Abraham's righteous or faith being counted to him as righteousness. We know that Abraham was not a righteous person in all his deeds. He did all kinds of things that were marked and put down, but how did he get righteousness? And then later on, when you go through the prophets and you have the actual law that is given, did God go, oh, I'm changing my mind and I'm no longer expecting the righteous to live by faith. You don't have to live by the law. No, even in the giving of the law, there was a concern and a command that the righteous shall live by faith. Over and again, this phrase is used all the way throughout the Old Testament. You should take the time to study it, to look at it. And find out how many places this phrase is used over and over and over again. The righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. So it's the same thing that has been said. If you're going to seek to commend yourself before God through acts of the law, you're going to have to pay the piper through that. If you come to God and you seek to hand Him your righteous deeds, He's going to put it next to the law and you're going to see how you failed. That is not what I want. Is that what you want? Our automatic inclination should immediately be no. No, that's not what I want. I do not want to go before God and say, but I did these deeds. I did these things before you. Because what are we going to hear? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I knew you not. Do I think personal holiness is important? Yes. Will we get to that in the chapters to come? Absolutely. Don't hear me say that personal holiness is not important. However, personal holiness is not the thing in which we take to God to commend ourselves unto Him. If we do, we will have to live by it, and we will fail miserably. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Christ redeemed us. Praise God. The concept of justification by faith alone brings us to a place where we look at the redemption of Christ. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He is the one that hung on the tree for us. He took the wrath of God for us. He bore the wrath of God, paying the penalty that our lawlessness has earned. Christ is our Redeemer. How often does the familiar reality of Christ as our Redeemer, the songs that we sing that say He is our Redeemer, how often does that bring contempt in our heart? And you're like, oh, I, I, never, I never treat this contemptibly. Mm. Do you? What does treating something with contempt look like? It could be just an utter callous disregard. It could just be kind of looking at it and going, meh, right? Just not caring. Not having it grip you and grab you like it should. Not having it be the thing that you pay attention to it and the attention that it deserves. The redemption of Christ Jesus in your life deserves your attention. It deserves your praise. It deserves your focus. And I would say very often we become very contemptible in the redemption of Christ because we are so familiar with it that we just pass it off. And we become like those children in the huddles. Many huddle leaders have shared with me over the course of this week that they had many kids in their groups, many kids in their groups that acted like they knew what was going on. And when you begin to ask them questions about it, you could see as I like to say, they don't know their butt from a hole in the ground. They had no clue what they were talking about. They had a mild measure of Christianese in which they could communicate back, but they didn't even know the words that they were using. They were just regurgitating things that they had heard. And so in their arrogance, they thought they knew. I would say that maybe one of the worst places to be is a pastor in the pulpit who studies this stuff all the time because they think they know. And they stand before people saying, I know, and you need to know too. 
And how often do I treat the redemption of Christ with contempt because of its familiarity, because I'm studying it week in and week out. Day in and day out, my eyes are before it. It's before my eyes. I read. I have to repent of that often. Treating cheaply the redemption of Christ rather than rejoicing. Rather than being ever thankful for it. Do you know the emotion that I had on Monday morning when I read the passage that I was going to be preaching? Meh. I hate to say it out loud, but I did. And then I shuddered and went like this, hoping that I wasn't going to get struck by lightning, which is a ridiculous thought, but it happened. Um, the fact is, is those who seem to be closest to these things struggle with their own flesh. And so, brother, sister, in Christ, I'm here begging you this morning as we read this phrase about Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. When we read that, we should rejoice. Why? Because Christ was hung on the cross for us. Because He suffered and bled and died on our behalf. That when He had great angst and He was in the garden praying, saying, let this cup pass from Me, He said, nevertheless, not My will, but Your will be done. And in obedience to the Father, He went. And if that doesn't grip you, you might be dead, my friends. You might be dead inside. Reach out to Christ and hold fast to Him and rejoice in the reality that He became a curse for us. So that in Christ, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Who are we? We're Gentiles. We're, we're a bunch of pagans from up north. The fact is, we are those who the promise that was given to Abraham many, many years ago is now come to all the families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham and his seed. And who is that seed? Jesus Christ. So when I read Genesis, I can make sense of that promise that has been given to him and his family and take it as our own. I can receive the blessing. I can receive what has been promised. So that we might receive the promised Holy Spirit or the promised Spirit through faith. What do you have in you if you are a Christian? The Spirit of God. Baptist thinker, all right? Don't minimize that. Right? How often do we minimize that as Baptists? We have a phrase in Baptist theology. The silent third member of the Trinity. Are you kidding me? The silent one? Yes, they say that because the references to God the Father and God the Son are much more numerous and clear to where the Holy Spirit within the Old Testament is not as clearly presented and the New Testament is not as often presented, which I think is a ridiculous theological term to place on it. The silent third member. Whoever came up with that, I want to say, I'll be kind, maybe, shut your mouth, man. Stop writing the stupidity. What damage has it done to the church? A lot. The Spirit of God is not silent. It is not though He sits there waiting and pining away for us. But He actually seals us and marks us as His and He is the paraclete, the helper. He helps us. That's a whole other sermon. I don't want to... Maybe I'll get into it. I don't know. We'll see. He helps us. He guides us. He leads us. He seals us. He is the one who indwells us and encourages us, convicts us, draws us near. He is the one that makes us know that we have been born again to a living hope that is found in Him. He is the one who clings to us when we are so, so unwilling to cling to Him. The promise of the Holy Spirit is something that is an amazing reality that we should rejoice in. And how often have I sit counseling Christians to hear they have nothing good to hold to. They have nothing good. And I'm like, are you born again? Yes, you got the Spirit of God. Rejoice in that. 
Are you born again? Yes. Then you are redeemed by Christ. Rejoice in that. Do you have breath in your lungs sustained by God? Rejoice in that. How much do we have to rejoice in in Christ? A ton. This is why the scriptures tell us to take captive our thoughts and put them in subjection to Christ. To wage this warfare that is going on around us and in us according to the weapons that God has handed us. Not reverting to the weapons of the world. And here today we've been handed yet again one more mighty weapon. A weapon that maybe we have forgotten about is in the arsenal. It is a weapon of justification by faith alone and the redemption of Christ that has been given us and the promises of God that are ours so that we might have the Holy Spirit. So who are you trusting in, Christian, and what are you holding on to? Are you taking the weapons that God has given you to wage the warfare set before you? Man, I hope so. I hope you stop forgetting what you have on your belt and you pull it out and start wielding it. Start using it. Start attacking. Stop acting like you're a victim to circumstances that are in your life. Rejoice in the goodness of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Rejoice in the Holy Spirit that you have been given. Be ever thankful for the redemption that is there and the message of justification that seems to be on every page of the Word. Do not let the mundane breed contempt within your heart, but let it breed intimacy and joy that you might sing and rejoice in the gospel and the things of Christ, no matter what. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning that we have in Christ. I thank you for this time that we can gather and sing, and I pray that you would help us to hold fast. I pray that you would help us to rejoice in your goodness. I pray that we would be ever thankful for the doctrine of justification by faith alone, that our righteousness comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's his righteousness that we are trusting in, not our own. Help us now as we sing with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.